Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 722 of the podcast and it is Friday the 3rd of November 2023 as I record this. In today's show, I'm talking about Pinterest for book marketing and direct sales with Trona Freeman. So Pinterest is not a social media site. It is a visual search and discovery engine. It drives traffic through SEO, search engine optimization, and has shoppable pins and direct integration with Shopify. So I am looking at it very seriously as part of my pivot into direct sales first and kind of back into more content marketing for fiction. And it also fits with how much I love making visual images and also is people's happy place. Pinterest as happy place is amazing. No hate, no politics, like many of the other social media sites. Well, this is not a social media site, which is why I'm pretty interested in it. So I talk about best practices with Trona, who is Scottish. So you will also enjoy her accent. That's coming up in the interview section. So in publishing this week, well, big news as KDP have announced an invite only KDP beta for audiobooks. So this is not unexpected given that Amazon are doubling down on AI and they have had Amazon Polly with a lot of AI voices for years now. And since Spotify have accelerated their audiobook plans and they allow AI narration, it was only going to be a matter of time before Audible allowed AI narration onto the platform. And this looks like the first step. So this announcement was posted on kdpcommunity.com. We're excited to announce the launch of an invitation-only US beta that enables KDP authors to quickly and easily produce an audiobook version of their ebook using virtual voice narration, a synthetic speech technology. I guess it's actually quite funny they don't use the, the term AI, but virtual and synthetic, <laughs> it's essentially the same thing. So authors will now be able to create an audiobook from an ebook in just a few steps. To publish an audiobook, authors will first choose one of their eligible ebooks on KDP. From there, authors can sample voices, preview, and customize the audiobook. Authors can set a list price between $3.99 and $14.99 and will receive a 40% royalty. Now, that is the exclusive royalty rate. Obviously, I mean, I use ACX and I use non exclusive. So uh, it, it will be interesting to see whether this is just for exclusivity. Um, we shall see. It goes on. After publication, audiobooks will be live within 72 hours and distributed where Audible titles are sold. KDP authors can also choose to work with professional narrators and voice talent through ACX. So it does sound like this will be on the ACX platform or maybe it will be through KDP. Be interesting to know what happens there. Uh, but certainly distributed where Audible titles are sold means on the Audible app and uh, on Amazon. Customers can find and listen to audiobooks with virtual voice wherever Audible audiobooks are available today. Audiobooks created through KDP from ebooks in KDP Select will be included in the Audible Plus catalogue and eligible for a share of the KDP Select Global Fund. Audible audiobooks created by Virtual Voice will be clearly labelled and, as with any audiobook, customers can listen to samples. We plan to grow the beta over time and will share updates in the coming months as we have additional information. So, yeah, it does sound like perhaps, I mean, this, this is only like a couple of paragraphs, so I'm just reading into it, I guess. But if you are in KDP Select, then it sounds like you'll be in the Audible Plus catalogue. So that is exclusivity. But it does kind of imply that th this might be open to other KDP authors. So you can sign up to be notified of the beta. I have signed up, but this is a US only 
programme at the moment. Who knows how long it will go on as just US only. If you are in it or you've been asked or been accepted, I'd love to know. Tell me about it. Joanna at thecreativepen.com. I certainly want in unless it means exclusivity, which I don't want to do. So it'd be very interesting. But I've I've done a couple of AI narrated uh, books now, a couple with Google Playbooks, which is free and non-exclusive, and a couple with Deep Zen, again, non-exclusive. Both of those are distributed everywhere except Audible and are clearly labelled as digitally narrated with a big sort of button on the cover and in the text. And I've got those on my, I sell those on my website and on various other stores. So just to be clear, though, on this, and I've talked about this before, but just to emphasize once again, I am also an audiobook narrator. (laughs) Those of you who just got the Kickstarter and got um, Writing the Shadow and a lot of my nonfiction books, some of my short stories, I narrate these and I make much better money when I human narrate these books. And I've also hired lots of human narrators over the years. But I, as, as I have been saying, I think we need to stratify audiobook rights. So there are multiple versions rather than one. The reason everyone hand rings over this is because they think that this will replace humans, but it won't. This What this will mean, this is really accessibility. If you think about how many books in the world, and again, Again, this is, is there are a lot of English language books, but most languages in the world, most accents in the world, do not have audiobooks for most books. So this is a chance to actually make content into audio that would not be in audio otherwise. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that by stratifying rights and having multiple versions rather than just one. For example, I'm obviously a British woman uh, and I speak English and I'm narrating my own books in English. Now, I would love for you to be able to have a, I don't know, an African-American man, male voice read my books or someone with an Indian accent or you're going to hear Trona later. You might love the Scottish accent and want my books read in a Scottish accent. You should have the choice to do that. And what I'm hoping and I've been saying for years, I think I should be able to change the voice on the app just as I do with uh, Siri or any of the, of the assistants. So that's the AI version. There should be AI versions in all kinds of voices and accents. Then there should be the artistic, human-voiced audiobook, which is relevant for specific types of books. I don't think that most non-fiction books need a particularly artistic voice. And in fact, sometimes I listen to books and I listen at like 1.5, 1.7 speed sometimes. It really would not matter. And a lot of human narrators for nonfiction actually sound like robots. (laughs) But I know that's not true for fiction. So I think we could have artistic, human voiced audiobooks. And of course, I still want you to buy my nonfiction in my voice. It's my words. uh, So I think that's different too. Also, the full multicast audio production. Uh, There should be room for all of this. And one of the issues is that audiobook rights contracts are story rights a lot of the times or full full audio rights. You can't stratify. And that is what I think should change so that we can have all of this different stuff. This is AI is a lot about abundance. So abundance of audio. And yes, basically everything will have an audio product as part of this. So AI to me is also amplified intelligence. And this will mean more audio, more accessibility for books that don't currently have audio, which is most of them, as I said. Human narrators, just like human authors and every other human in a lot of other jobs, have to prove their difference and their worth. So I can narrate your book is not important anymore. As in the same for us, I can write a book. That's not remarkable anymore. You have to stand out. And what is remarkable is you. If you are a narrator, it is the way you perform. Uh, If you're an author like me and you listening, it's us that makes things different. It is not the function of narration or the function of writing. AI can do those functions. (laughs) The most important thing is us. You are remarkable. Um, So I hope that makes you feel better. 
So check out my recent video and blog post on how to double down on being human, five ways to stand out in an age of AI. So all of us, we need to be more human and stand out in that way, not just by saying, well, I can write a book really fast. Well, so can AI. Or I can narrate this book in standard English female voice. Well, so can AI. You know, that's not what is remarkable anymore. Used to be, not anymore. (laughs) So we have to find ways to emphasise what is remarkable about us. So that's that side of it. Um, Also, I do think there is a new job uh, for AI assisted audiobook production. It is not just a one click output, even as as this uh, this press release says, basically, you will have to sample voices, preview and customise the audiobook. So essentially the same with working with a human narrator, you can adjust uh, the various pronunciations of names or maybe add another beat of silence in between a paragraph or whatever you want to do. So that production, that listening, that QA function is still needs to be done. And that needs to be done for AI assisted audiobooks. And I've asked a few companies about this, and they've all said they're not doing it. But that might change. Because I think KDP doing this audible doing this is going to make AI narration finally mainstream. So this is just the beginning. Hopefully they'll roll this out. Let me know if you use it. I am really interested. Obviously, a lot of people are using the Google one right now that's still free. Um, This is also free. uh, So yeah, very interesting times. So in useful things, if you want to plan your author business for 2024, Orna Ross has a Kickstarter campaign for creative planning, launching today as this goes out at selfpublishingadvice.org forward slash planners 24. Orna is a poet and also writes historical fiction as well as non-fiction. She's the founder of the Alliance of Independent Authors and we do a podcast together every few months and she has been, Orna has been a creative mentor to me for over a decade. She is fantastic. I highly recommend her work and it is very creative planning. This is not black and white spreadsheets (laughs) and if you love black and white spreadsheets, all good. This is not that. (laughs) If you don't like at black and white spreadsheets and you still want to plan your work, check it out at selfpublishingadvice.org forward slash planners24. Also, a book recommendation if you are interested in financial independence, sometimes called FI. Uh, so you might have heard of FIRE, the Financial Independence Retire Early Movement. I'm more of the FI uh, community, not the FIRE. Uh, so this book, anyway, is called Pathfinders and it's edited by J.L. Collins, who wrote The Simple Path to Wealth, which is basically the model I follow. It is simple. <laughs> and and mostly on autopilot. Uh, But this new book, Pathfinders, has lots of stories from people who follow this path, and hopefully you'll find it inspirational. And I'm certainly enjoying the audiobook on my walks recently. I already do everything they talk about, but it's always good to revisit the basics of finance and money mindset. So yes, that is Pathfinders, edited by J.L. Collins, out now. In personal news, this week I have been very busy fulfilling the Kickstarter for Writing the Shadow. I finished and mastered the audiobook and uh, everything there has has been done. And I know that many people take months to fulfill Kickstarters and then um, some people do the work after the Kickstarter has run. But I have this incredible need. I think I am actually very good at finishing energy. Finishing energy is a strong point for me. And I need to close the circle and fulfill as quickly as possible. Um, I haven't even got the money yet, but I desperately want people who backed to have the book. <laughs> So all the digital rewards have gone out. If you backed Writing the Shadow at the ebook, audiobook, digital bundle, or if you bought add-ons like the PDF workbook or my ebook bundles for nonfiction or fiction, you should have everything. I've sent it all out through Kickstarter. But please check your Kickstarter account if you haven't received those emails. I have noticed that email deliverability has been difficult for some people. So email me or message me on Kickstarter if you don't have what you ordered in terms of the digital rewards. I have also 
put the print orders into Book Vault. This is nerve wracking. Okay, so you download the spreadsheet from Kickstarter and then I turn that spreadsheet into the Book Vault format and they upload the orders into the system. And I spent uh, almost a full day on this uh, because I was so paranoid about making sure everything was right. So checking and rechecking all the orders, but I've I've pretty much checked every single one. (laughs) And it's all good. The unsigned copies will be printed and mailed um, this week as this goes out, I guess. And then I'll also be signing the gold foil editions, the hardbacks in Peterborough next week, the end of next week as this goes out. Um, I am still trying to track down a few people to get physical mailing addresses for the books. And I've tried these particular people. None of my emails are getting through and I've sent them from Kickstarter and through my various email accounts I have. So if you back the Kickstarter for print books and you haven't done your survey, please can you message or email me joanna at thecreativepen.com. I want to make sure everyone gets their books. I'm not quite ready to name people yet on the show. I will be trying to find you. It's like detective work. That's what I'm reframing it as. It's like detective work to figure out who these people are. Because this is the funny thing now. Like I said, I have multiple email accounts. I'm sure you do as well. We just use different emails for different things, right? So if you if you used a different email on Kickstarter, this would be another tip. You may well find that emails aren't getting through or they disappear or something. So yes, just a reminder, not just for my Kickstarter, but for everyone's, as I, I think we're all starting to back more in the community, please keep an eye on them. So as this goes out, I will be in Las Vegas at the 20 Books Conference, which is the biggest indie author conference in the world, possibly the biggest author conference full stop. So I'm excited to meet lots of my patrons at our meetup as well as friends and colleagues in the business. I have lots of meetings, pretty much back-to-back meetings all week lined up. I'm also speaking on lots of panels. I'm on a panel about AI, uh, one on thrillers, another on Kickstarter, a memoir and travel. I'm also on the high-powered author panel, which I find kind of crazy as the authors on that panel usually have hundreds of books. So I'm going to be the odd one out. (laughs) my imposter syndrome is on full alert. But I guess I'm glad to represent a different kind of career from a multiple streams of income approach. I am not a high volume production person and that has worked out fine for me. So I hope I can bring a different perspective to that panel. I am also slightly worried about my energy for the whole week and thanks to everyone who sent me introvert and sensitive person energy management tips back in April when I was overwhelmed after London Book Fair and 20 Books Seville. And I have just posted an article on the blog rounding it all up in uh, an article called In-Person Conference Tips, Energy Management for Introverts and Highly Sensitive People. So I'll link to that in the show notes. So, of course, at 20 books, I expect to learn a lot and uh, be inspired. And of course, I will be sharing this with you. It will be the week after next after I have recovered. So thanks for your emails and comments this week. Ailani left a comment on Tracy's episode. Thanks for sharing the insightful dialogue with Tracy Cooper Posey on how to sustain and revitalise an author business over time. The tips on rejuvenating one's writing process, managing a backlist and bracing for the publishing roller coaster are invaluable. The idea of stashing the cash, books and email list resonates well as a prudent approach to building a resilient author business. Glad you enjoyed that, Ailani. And that it was a, a comment left on the blog, thecreativepen.com. You can just go to the episode and leave a comment there. On YouTube, Chester Davis 20, what's 27 said, listening from Chile, Murfreesboro, TN. Now, I think that's Tennessee. Across the street from a park and Civil War battlefield. I added Tracy's book to my Amazon wish list just now. Fantastic. And Jimmy Kepler sent a picture enjoying a cup of Earl Grey tea in Kawakawa, New Zealand, listening to the show while on holiday. And yes, I know Jimmy's on a cruise. I hope you had a wonderful holiday, Jimmy. Thanks for listening while you're away. So you can leave a comment on the podcast show notes at thecreativepen.com or on the YouTube channel or email me, send me pictures of where you're listening, joanna at thecreativepen.com. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So this episode is sponsored by Ingram Spark. 
So I use Ingram Spark to print and distribute my self published print books wide because Ingram Spark helps me share my story with the world. And just to be clear, so I mentioned Book Vault earlier, I'm doing the special print edition with Book Vault with the gold foil and the, the ribbon and everything. And I'm doing this all for the Kickstarter. But I also have my print books on pre order through Ingram Spark for Writing the Shadow and all my books. So I use KDP Print for Amazon only, Ingram Spark for bookstores, libraries, universities, and Book Vault for Shopify and Kickstarter. So they reach different readers in different markets. So I absolutely count Ingram Spark as an important part of my print ecosystem. So why even consider Ingram Spark? Well, if you only use KDP Print, bookstores, libraries, universities, print on demand sites in many countries will not consider your book because you need to offer a discount and you'll also be in their catalogue. If you care about getting your books into these places, go wide with your print. Ingram Spark now have an ultra premium colour option, ideal for books that include images and graphics that would benefit from sharp, crisp contrast. And ultra premium books have offset printing colour quality. Also available now, groundwood paper, a lightweight, thicker paper, mostly paired with mass market and trade content. You will have access to over 40,000 retailers, independent bookstores, libraries, schools and universities, chain bookstores and more across a global network. Of course, it means your books will be available to order, but you still have to drive demand. You can choose to use returns, but it's not necessarily I do not use returns. And you can choose your discount percentage. You can also bulk order, for example, if you're speaking and you need back of the room copies, or if you work direct with schools or bookstores, you can just ship direct from Ingram in different places. The best part, Ingram Spark now has free book set up for print or ebooks and offers free revisions on your book in the first 60 days. So what are you waiting for? Share your story with the world. Head on over to ingramspark.com. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing, but my time is sponsored by my patrons at patreon.com forward slash the creative pen. Thanks to all patrons who've been supporting the show for years and months. You're amazing. I'm so glad you find the show useful after all this time. So the Patreon is now pivoting into more of a community where I share behind the scenes details on the business of being an author. It currently has several videos on AI for writing and images, as well as behind the scenes of my Shopify store. Plus, you get the monthly Q&A where I answer questions around writing craft, publishing, marketing, mindset, making money, AI and more. So that's 45 minutes of extra audio a month, pretty much an extra episode of the show. But I just answer your questions. So it's like a solo show every month with much more to come. It is now a monthly subscription equivalent to a black coffee a month. So if you would like to buy me a coffee a month uh, or a flat white or two, if you're feeling generous because the price of those have gone up, then uh, join us. And thanks to new and returning patrons this week, Joanne, Brooke, Lynn, Jamie, Beth Prince, Jen, Judy, Brian, Nims, Pamela and Moose. You can join us in the community and support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Trona Freeman specialises in Pinterest services and marketing for small business. She has a master's in history of art and lives in Scotland. So welcome to the show, Trona. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm excited to talk about this. Before we get into it, tell uh-huh. us a bit more about you and why you focus particularly on Pinterest. So I did my master's in history of art oh, about 10 years ago now. And then I was going to do a PhD, but I fell pregnant with my son, who's now nine. So I thought I'm going to take something up that isn't too overwhelming, but will still keep my mind ticking over. So I started blogging. And from that, I really fell in love with Pinterest and SEO. And I started learning more about it and helping other people use it. I started a newsletter, which then turned into my business, which I've had now for five years. But I think it's just an incredible way to connect with people online. So these people are actually looking for you. You're not disrupting them on their social media or anywhere else. They're actively looking for you. So that's why I love it. 
So it's really interesting that, you know, Pinterest has been around for a long time, but mm-hmm. social media has changed so much in yep. the last decade. Like you mentioned, your your son is nine. I think social media has changed as much as your son <laughs> yeah. has yep. <laughs> since he was born. So what is Pinterest like now and how can authors kind of think about it? So Pinterest, I think the best way to think about Pinterest is that it's actually more like a search engine than social media. And Pinterest themselves describe it as a visual search and discovery engine. So people go there to search for visual imagery, but it's also connected to keywords which are really important for t- to help you get found on there. So it's like if Google and Instagram had a baby, you kind of get Pinterest. So I think a lot of people still see it as social media and there are still elements to it. So you can comment on pins, you can uh, like pins and so on. But in the main, it is actually a really powerful search engine. So I guess the other thing there is you said people are looking for things. So I think about it as I think it comes up in terms of, oh, if you're doing interior design, Mm. you can find really nice bathrooms on Pinterest. But it's like we don't hear about it much in terms of book marketing anymore. So can you maybe go into some more detail in the different ways that authors could think about and use Pinterest? So I think even as a means to storyboard your work, like on a personal level, you can use it. I I recently read that the Stranger Things writers used it to storyboard their whole the whole series from the looks, the inspiration. And that's how a lot of other people use it as well. But for you to attract people to you, you have to think about how people are searching for whatever you write. So if you're a non-fiction writer, um, people will search things like um, how to start writing, writing tips, writing prompts, and so on. There's actually lots and lots on there. And journaling is really huge on Pinterest as well, which I know a lot of authors use as a means to uh, keep up their ideas. So that's a really good way to share how maybe how your story develops, but also to attract people to your website, which then can get email signups, sales, and just more eyes on your work in general. Okay, so that's a non-fiction example. Mm-hmm. So let, let's talk a bit about fiction. So the storyboarding, I guess we can create pictures within our world. Um, what are some other ways that fiction authors could use it? So I did a little search earlier and there's lots of um, fantasy book authors coming up. There was a lot of thriller, mystery, romance, a whole, you know, a whole genres coming up. And what a lot of it was to do with was best books to read for autumn or books to read in a dark night. So horror authors could think about how they could share their work and maybe in lists or share pins for like best horrors for a, a scary Friday night or something like that because people search Pinterest with sort of the intent to do something. So it can be something as little as just cozying up at a fire or it can be more gifting ideas. Maybe people are looking for gifts to give to their friend who loves writing and reading. Um, So yeah, the opportunity, there's actually lots and lots of opportunities on there. And I think one of the best things to do is just start with your genre and pop it in uh, the search the little search bar and see what Pinterest comes back and see if you can think about how you can use those ideas that are coming up in your content or pins that you create. Oh, there's so much I want to go into. So (laughs) just for people listening, I've been using it for probably a decade now Mm. and my Pinterest handle is JF Pen. So I've mainly used it for fiction. But let's go into that idea, best books to read for autumn, for example. We're recording this in October and you mentioned the how to write as a kind of niche or the how to journal. A similar thing could be best books to read for writing a novel or something like that. So the same kind of idea could be used. But can you just go into that? So when you say a pin, so can you explain what is a pin and what are some best practices around the image and the text and the keywords? So a pin is a sort of a little bookmark that you can share onto Pinterest and then people will then save that onto those boards. The pins can appear in your home feed. 
So if you're just having a scroll through it, Pinterest can share out your pins to people that they think will will engage with it. Or you can be found through the search feed. So that's somebody popping in these search terms that we were just talking about there. And then you have the opportunity to come up. So yeah, there's lots of opportunities to get found. You can also be featured by Pinterest. They have seasonal trends that can come up. So they do feature writers and authors and ideas around that as well. Mm. So... But oh, sorry, sorry, just to be even more basic, because yeah. okay. um, <laughs> I think you're taking for granted people know what a pin is. So it's essentially an, an image. Yep, it's an image. So that can either be a still image, which would be a standard pin, or you can have a video pin and an idea pin. They're kind of uh, similar now, but you can still, they're, they're still saying that they're idea pins, even though they're video pins. It's very complicated at the moment. But the main thing is, is that you have a standard pin which is your regular two by three image that you pop up, your video pin or your idea pin. And your idea pin is very similar to a TikTok, a reel, the stories that you share on Instagram, they're the same size. So it's a good way to repurpose content. Okay, so the two by three, so it is a, yeah. like a book cover. If people in their minds, yeah. it's a book cover. But if you're doing, so best books to read for autumn, mm-hmm. some of these pins are, are much longer than two by yeah. three, I've noticed. So what? So if we're doing like, let's say we've, we've got 10 books to read for autumn, do we make a super, super long kind of article style image? Uh, so what Pinterest will do if they're too long, they'll truncate them because people used to do something called giraffe pins and they were these ones that you saw and they were really, really long and they're good because they take up a lot of uh, room on your, your screen so that you click on them. So they will get truncated if they are, they're too long. So the two by three is their recommended size. And mm. you can, but you can play about with pixels. So that would be, say they recommend that you do minimum 1000 by 1500 pixels. So if you're sharing that from your website, that can pull a lot of memory from your website. So you can upload directly to Pinterest. Yeah. And so in Canva, so I use Mm -hmm. canva.com to do a lot of my images. And I know they have a lot of Pinterest designs that you can take and use as your own. But I know people listening like, okay, that's a kind of list post that people can use. But what if I'm, I've got pictures just so for example, my books and travel dot page website, which is Mm -hmm. um, my travel site has articles and about my travels. A lot of those images are not the two by three size and I do pin the images from my site so how is that because I'm kind of doing that in the hope that people will click on them and I get traffic back to books and travel but what's the best practice for doing that kind of thing? So what I would recommend doing then is taking the image that you have from your website and then using it in the template that you're describing on Canva so that will be the optimal size for Pinterest and that's and then you can upload directly to Pinterest and just add your pin description and add the URL, which will then link back to your website. So it doesn't ha- you don't have to have the image on your website, but it can really help if you do. So mm. maybe you would want to add a Pinterest image at the very bottom of your blog post, for example. That's what a lot of people do. And then it's easy to be shared that way. Yes, so that I did start doing that originally, mm. but I've got so many sort of really nice pictures, but they're not that size. Yeah. Um, but people do, so when I do scroll on Pinterest, I do it generally on my desktop. So it doesn't really matter what the image sizes are, but I guess they, they do it that size for a mobile type device. Yeah, yeah. and a lot of people do use uh, their mobile for Pinterest. So that's why you want to make sure that if you are creating the pin images, and you are writing text on the pin image, that it is a size that can be easily read so people aren't struggling. And plus it's more eye-catching, but it's a quicker way for people to understand if the pin is for them if you add a little bit of textual overlay that is easily readable. Okay, so let's come back to the keywords and the Mm -hmm. search terms that people might put in. Because again, it's kind of funny, the sort of long tail keywords that people do around stuff. So can you give us some more tips on keywords for our books? So what to do is just go to Pinterest and play about with 
the words that are related to whatever you write about. So say you have a blog post, for example, and it's about uh, how to start as a writer for beginners. That's actually really popular on there. So if you go on and just do that search, you will also get little guided searches. Those are little bubbles at the top. And those are further keywords that you can use. And the more of those keywords that show up means that there's a bigger search, which is brilliant because then you can use lots of different keywords. Maybe if you want to do a different pin later, you can then use those uh, keywords to uh, attract a slightly different traffic because people search slightly differently all the time. So if you do use different keywords, it allows you to hit different traffic throughout the year as well. So that's why you would want to use the seasonal keywords as well so like we just mentioned there about halloween christmas that will help keep your pins relevant but going back to the keyword research just have a look at what's coming up have a look at what keywords is relevant for what you're writing about and then you can use them in your pin description your pin title and if you're going to use a textual overlay you can use them on that as well because it's not only a good way for the people to quickly see if it's for them because if they are scrolling, finding uh, what they want, the, you know, the quicker we grab their attention, the better. But Pinterest can also read the text on the overlay, which helps with uh, SEO. It can speed up indexing and know how to distribute it to quicker. Okay, so again, using an example of a blog post, but let's lose, use an example of a book that people, mm-hmm. people listening, they're like, I want to sell my book. So either I want to direct people to Amazon yeah. to buy my book, or I want to direct it for me. And we'll come back directly to Shopify. But in terms yeah. of we want to send traffic to a store. So I mean, I just the very basic thing is, do we upload a book cover and then link that to wherever we want people to click through? Is it is a shopping a good intent for yeah. people? Yes. Yeah, so Pinterest is moving much, much more towards shoppable pins. So you can tag your pin with an even an affiliate link so you could get that little bit extra on your book sale as well so you can add your amazon link and tag it which then just makes it more shoppable it's easier for people to see the intent behind this is something that you want people to purchase from it's not a blog post or an idea this is shopping intent and Pinterest will pick that up too and they will put it under that search for shop eh, shopping. It's very similar to eh, Google SEO where the intent behind the search is important. Mm. So there will be different intent between somebody starting out looking to f- just how do they start being an author to someone who's actually looking for the best books to read on a holiday, for example. The, the intent's different. So let's talk about Shopify because the reason mm-hmm. I wanted to talk to you is because I have my two stores and I've read, in fact, I got approached by a Pinterest paid ad yeah. person from Pinterest and yeah. they said, look, we think you should do paid Pinterest ads. And I was like, whoa, I haven't even been anywhere near Pinterest <laughs> for years. Yeah. So can you talk a bit about the uh, integration between Pinterest and Shopify? So Currently, there's a couple of different ways that you can link your Shopify store to Pinterest. They have the Pinterest for Shopify app, which kind of does it all for you. Or you can link manually by adding the uh, the Pinterest tag to Shopify. The Pinterest tag is very similar to Facebook Pixel, for example. And even if you're not going to run uh, Pinterest ads, you get access to something called Conversion Insights. This is a deeper insight than your standard analytics. So I do recommend that you add that even if you're not going to run ads, you're just going to do completely organic stuff on Pinterest. It just gives you much better insight. And it's pretty straightforward. Uh, Shopify and Pinterest work really well together. Mm. So and I did that I added as soon as I spoke to this guy and I said to him look I am interested but I don't I'm going to come back once I've yeah. actually done something yeah. so but I did add that tag and as you said it's like the meta pixel yeah. um, which again but neither of these words are good words I think they just <laughs> it's just some code that you put in your site it's not difficult exactly. though yeah 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 exactly but um okay so once we've got that on the site so you mentioned they're organic now Mm -hmm. yes you can pay for 
Pinterest ads. But let's just talk about that organic side. So is that really just about doing the SEO work and doing yeah. these descriptions and titles and things? Yeah. So again, just think about it as being the sort of visual search engine. Have a look at how people are using it, how you can fit your products, your blog posts, your articles, and anything you have to do that you can share with people and create your pins around it. And once you start to see traction on there, have a look at your analytics. You can see which pins are driving the most engagement, traffic, and so on to your website. And saves are important too. They are a really powerful part of Pinterest algorithm. Even though we would prefer to have traffic to our site, Pinterest put a heavier weight on saves. So that's very important too. And typically, what I have seen over the five years is pins that get more saves are ones that are really pretty. So that would be, and they don't have a textual overlay. Those are ones that people want to save to their boards and maybe like um, book aesthetic. That's actually really popular on there. You know, pretty settings of a mug with a book and so on, the kind of one I mean. Mm. But if you want to get people to act and come over to your website, typically adding text drives that traffic more. It's You might think what you're saying is really obvious, but really tell people what you want them to do. You know, come over to my website, find out more. Those simple call to action can really help boost traffic to your site. And when you get a good insight to what is happening, then I would recommend putting some money behind those organic pins that work really well. Yeah, as you say. And it's so interesting (laughs) thinking about this and I'm really trying to figure out what I should do. I've got this old Pinterest. Well, it's not old. I have been updating it for every book, but I look at it and I'm like, oh my goodness, I have really old pins (laughs) on this. Should I spend time cleaning it up or should I just start with new pins? I would recommend just starting with new pins. So with Pinterest, there's no set engagement time. So for example, if you put a pin up and nothing happens, I wouldn't recommend taking that down because it can suddenly start taking off months and even years. And that's very typical. A lot of people will have traffic from pins from three, four, five years ago. So you just never know when something's going to take off. So unless it really is nothing to do with what you do anymore, you really, you know, you really hate what you've attached it to or something like that, then you can delete it. But otherwise, just start from where you are and then you can optimise your boards and your pins going forward. And what I would recommend doing, just go through those keyword uh, research, which you can do in the search. But oh, Pinterest also have a trends tool, which is similar to uh, Google Trends. So you can go in there and have a little deep dive at what keywords are more popular than others, which ones are coming up seasonally, and then you can use those two. But I would, the only thing with that is that Pinterest have said that not all the keywords are in their trends tool currently. So if there's a keyword in there that you're not getting any details back on, any analytics information or whatever, go back to Pinterest and put it in their search bar there. And if you're coming up with more information there, use what they're saying there. But the trends tool is really good. It will tell you when things are going to take off or you can look historically back at it and see when you can use things in the future. So it's the same. Yeah, once you get all that information there, you can start putting them on your profile and that includes your name. So you could maybe put that you you help authors or whatever it is that you do, just a little blurb in your name. Then in your profile bio, put those some keywords in there. But keep it organic. Use it like you're speaking to somebody and just explaining what you do, what your books are about, how you can help somebody. And then Mm. similarly, put it through your boards, um, have your board description, uh, sorry, your board title, have that very clearly named. So that would be how to start as an author, for example, um, writing prompts and so on. Then you could even have some seasonal boards, Christmas gift ideas for book lovers, for example. And then in the board description, 
have a couple of paragraphs. Again, organically, like you're talking to your friend or somebody who's interested in your work and use those keywords again throughout that and then start popping your pins in there. And you want to use those keywords on your pin titles, your pin description, and have those also corresponding to the landing page. Because Pinterest uses something called pin cohesion. It's a big part of sort of combating spam and making sure that what the pin is talking about is matched by the landing page. So you want to have that close or synonymous with uh, what the pin is about and what the landing page is about. No, that's great. So again, coming let's come back to a few things. So you so we're talking about boards mm-hmm. and board I think board is actually a good word it's like a, yeah. a grouping and on the screen a board has got loads of pins so it's like an image with pinned images on yeah. a board so I think that's quite good but so for my fiction I mm-hmm. have a board each board is the name of the book so I might have a board for stone of fire now stone of fire is not really an seo term no. it's a descriptor for my book so if I and I have a, a Pinterest board per book and in my each of the, my books in my author's note I say you can see pictures about this book on Pinterest so I need to keep all those boards yeah. per book but if I'm thinking about all right I'm gonna revitalize my Pinterest would I create a board around each series for example arcane action adventure supernatural thrillers yep and then I would put new pins on that board yeah. for the whole series. Yeah. So you could probably create three to four pins per book and those could go through three to four boards, for example. So the main thing to keep in mind when creating boards is make sure that you're putting your pin into relevant boards. So you could, for example, if we take a fantasy book of yours, you could have a general board for fantasy books, best fantasy books this year, something like that. Then you could also put it in um, gift, a gift guide for fantasy lover, people who love fantasy books, and you could pop it in there because that, that could help with the seasonal idea. And then you could have a really general board for your books. So that would be fiction books and then have a description that explains the kind of pins that are in that. And that could be a wide range of stuff. So that could have your other books in there as well. So it's just thinking about all the sort of little buckets that you could pop your books into, all the content that those books cover, and how people would then find them using those keywords on Pinterest. Yeah, I think I haven't really thought about what people are looking for. I've Mm. really thought about I'm just driving people to it to provide a different view of my books yeah. but it, what you're talking about is is exactly right and what I'm trying to get to so it's really changing the mindset to yeah. what will people be looking for so I make a pin I can pin that on multiple boards yeah just the only thing I would recommend is if you are doing that to multiple boards don't do it all at once spread oh, okay. it out yeah because otherwise it can be seen as spam so just make sure that you're spreading it out over a length of time and that is going to be completely dependent on how much content you share in between that so if somebody goes to your profile your pinterest profile and looks at your created feed currently that probably change it changes all the time but currently it's the created feed and they see the same pin over again it you know it's kind of off-putting but you can change the image on the one pin but still have it linking to the url so you can use different images which I recommend doing so you could have for example two plain images of a photo and then maybe another one with a textual overlay so you could get the saves on it and then you can also get the the traffic driving out. Okay so scheduling is something I really like doing so what tools do you recommend for scheduling so we don't have to spend all our time on this? So I really like Tailwind still and Pinterest also have their own uh, scheduling app on there as well. But that doesn't allow you to share it out to different boards in the same way that Tailwind can. And you then can't change the pin description and the Pinterest uh, scheduler like you can with Tailwind. 
So I think Tailwind is just easier because you can change your pin description, the images in a way that you can on Pinterest, and then you can share them out to your boards through Tailwind. And then you can put the gap in between of a few days, a week, a month, whatever it needs to be. So I do really recommend Tailwind. They still have, I think they have a free one for about 100 pins per month now, which it might have changed, but it's a good way to get started to see if that's going to be useful for you. But mm-hmm. yeah, scheduling is just, yeah, because it means that you're not, you can sit down on a Monday, for example, and put all your pins out for the whole month or the week or however you plan to keep on top of it. And then you don't need to think about it. Yes, well, that's exactly right. And I guess, I mean, just for context, I, I'm i really looking at changing. I mean, I think we all are kind of changing the way we use yeah. social media, even though Pinterest, yeah. as you said, is more like a search engine. And so I'm kind of taking the energy that I used to put into Twitter or X yeah. and, and really looking at Pinterest. But also I think now with Shopify, with that integration, I just feel like the energy and the time that I, I used to spend on one place I could spend more the better time mm. here on Pinterest because I like I like the idea of it. I like the visual images. So I really like that. I did have another question around mm-hmm. engagement and you mentioned saves. So I love tattoos. I don't have them myself, but I'm pretty into tattoos. So when I do go on Pinterest, I often see tattoos and I, I like them and I save them to my boards, like my desecration board and, and that series has a lot of tattoos in. Mm-hmm. So that's that is a sort of me engaging by saving to my yeah. own boards so should we also be doing that like if I just schedule stuff and never go in there should I be going in and saving and engaging so you do not need to do that uh, Pinterest have said themselves that you can pin all your own pins you do not have to do anybody else's there was a math going about years ago that you had to pin 80% your own and 20% somebody else's uh, and it's, Pinterest came out and said that that's absolutely not true. The good w- thing with going into Pinterest and doing that is that you keep on top of what's happening on the platform. So you do not have to do it, but I think it can be good to pop in every now and again and just so you keep on top of maybe the changes because Pinterest is a fast-changing platform, mm. especially over the last couple of years. And I think next year we will see more changes. There was a lot of changes at the top and other people brought in, which looks like it is heading to be even more shoppable than it is now. So I do think popping in there, just to keep on on top of what's happening on it, is good. Um, Mm. But you do not need to do that. You don't need to do that. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, you don't need to do that. (laughs) And what about comments? Like, do I, because this is what drives me nuts. Like, Mm. I don't want to respond to comments. I just don't want to be on social media. (laughs) So do I have to watch what people type or? No, no, not really. I think, so a while ago, there was like, you used to get really, really odd comments. And I don't know why it happened. I don't know if people were doing it as it helped them bookmark it or kept it organised for themselves. So I don't know. But sometimes you will get a nice comment and obviously it's nice to comment back, but you do not have to. It's not something that you need to do. I have clients that are very successful on Pinterest and they don't do anything like that. Yes, that's another reason I like this. And I kind of, originally, I think when I went on Instagram, I thought that Instagram would be that way. Mm. But to my distress, there's actually quite a lot of chatting that involved on Instagram. And that's fine. And I like it a little bit. But I certainly, I don't want another social media thing where I have to be social. But like you're saying, this this doesn't have to to be that way. So that's interesting. So you mentioned all the changes going on. So I I love Midjourney. I'm using Dali and other mm-hmm. AI tools to create images. And I, I specifically asked the Pinterest guy, is it okay to pin AI created images? And he said, yes, absolutely yeah. fine. So what do you recommend with those? Is it just creating them around the world of our fiction or any, any thoughts on that? So Pinterest is actually going to bring out their own AI of course uh, they are. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone so, is. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember what they've called this it. winner. It's Creative something. But they announced it in one of their uh, webinars that they do every now and again. And I think it's going to come next year. And it is to help uh, create pins more quickly. 
So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I think Pinterest one will be really good because they have something called Pinterest Labs, which they have been running for years and years. And this is where they develop AI and it's very cutting edge and it's very, very good. So I think their one will be very useful. But yeah, currently you can create your images around uh, the context of your book because that will help people understand what the book is about. And then again, you can either embed them on your own website or you can upload them directly to Pinterest via Pinterest itself or a scheduling tool like uh, Tailwind. Yeah, so I think that's another reason I'm excited about this because I love creating images that kind of of my characters and and a lot of us are doing that. And uh, even though some people are worried about using these in book covers, which in some cases is understandable, although I do, but when it's just, when it's just, I mean, this is putting an image and then linking it to your book. So you're not, no one's paying for that image. So I guess I think that's fine, yeah. however you feel about it. So, okay, no, that's really interesting that yeah. they're, they're going to come up with that. Anything else that you think might be coming? As I said, I think we're going to see it ahead in more shoppable, which is going to be really interesting. I think they might have their own shopping cart in Pinterest. Right. So that will make things much easier. But yeah, AI just seems to be taking over at the moment and the Pinterest are already cutting edge in it. They have a lot of stuff on their Medium page, which you can have a look at. A lot of it's algorithm and heavily engineer driven, but it's very interesting if you're uh, looking for a deeper dive in how Pinterest works and what they're going to do next. It's very interesting. But yeah, I think we're going to definitely see more shoppable features. Um, They're going to include their shuffles app on it which is it's kind of aimed at gen z and the gen z has been using it to create collages around maybe um a day out uh outfit choice that type of thing and those are going to be shoppable as well i believe so oh nice yeah i think that's going to be really interesting it's going to be a really fun way to connect with people i think and That's one of the great things about Pinterest is that it is overwhelmingly people's happy place online. Yes. Um, I think it's Mm. something like eight out of 10 people say it's their safe, happy place. It's where they go to get inspired. It's where they go to just think about themselves, what they want to learn, find out. And that's a really inspiring way to connect with your audience. Yes, that's another reason I like it. It's certainly like it's, well, from what I've seen and experienced, it's not political. Yep. It's not filled with hate, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. unlike some other platforms we could mention. Um, it is very much, like you say, it's it's a happy place. Yeah. And so, and people do go to purchase. That's the other yep. thing about it. They go to buy stuff. Yeah. Um, which I think is really interesting. Um, okay, so... Is, are there any other tools? So you've mentioned Tailwind. That was the main tool. And we've talked yeah. about Canva, yeah. obviously, for images. Any other tools or tips that, that you have? I think those are my favourite ones. Canva, absolutely, as well. Um, what I do recommend doing, because if you go to Canva and search for Pinterest templates, you might find that a lot of people are already using those. So instead of that, you can search for, like, Instagram ad template Facebook template, whatever, and then just resize it Mm. for Pinterest. And it's a really good way to get an original template for yourself that other people aren't using. So I think that's a good tip. Yeah, I like like that one. And Um, just so people know, there's an auto resize button as well. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. So you can, yeah, you could, and that's changing currently as well, isn't it? They have their magic. Yes, their magic yeah. create also loads of AI powered stuff yeah. within Canva. Yeah. But I do think that there's a lot more potential imagination involved in this, particularly for fiction, which is yeah. why I'm excited about it. But um, any sort of big mistakes that you see authors or other creators making with Pinterest? I think the main one is that people think it's another social media platform. And that's not your fault or anybody's fault. That's absolutely how a lot of other places describe it but Pinterest don't do such a good job at letting people understand that that's not what they are they are uh, this powerful visual search and discovery engine and I think when you understand that 
it really shifts your perspective on it as a platform. It's about how you can connect with people rather than just putting your own stuff out there, like on Instagram, for example. It's less about you and more about them and how you can help them and inspire them in some way. No, I love that. I'm definitely going to try and change my <laughs> change my mindset. And as you say, <laughs> think more Google search and SEO, yeah. search engine optimization than social media. So, okay. So tell us what kind of help and services and courses do you offer in terms of Pinterest? Let people know where they can find you online. So I have a wide range of services. I actually do SEO too. I think SEO and Pinterest are two of the best ways to get found online in a way that doesn't take up so much of your time. So yeah, I am at services.ilend.com and the I is a sort of Scottish ok because <laughs> that was from my beauty blog, Ilend. Um, you know, a very clever play of words. I'll put the link in the show notes. <laughs> yeah. And I offer one-to-one training. I have a Pinterest SEO course. I have management and I have completely customizable packages as well, as well as SEO services. So there's a whole host of things there to help you get started and grow on Pinterest. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Trona. That was great. You're very welcome. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. So I hope you found the interview with Trona interesting and I will be sharing more on Pinterest in 2024 as I move into using it more for content marketing direct to my jfpenbooks.com Shopify store. I love the idea of using my AI images to bring my fictional worlds to life and also share more from my booksandtravel.page site, which I am resurrecting uh, as I get into some more nonfiction writing. So more on that to come. So next week, I'm talking about the mindset and business of selling direct with Russell Nolte. We talk about the mindset shift required if you want to sell direct, tips for Kickstarter campaigns, marketing books direct, the long-term flywheel approach to an author business, and more. In the meantime, happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.